Welcome to On Trial, starring Mark Radlich. Also starring Sean Comer. Hope you're ready, Hollywood, because you're on trial. All rise. Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Harry T. Stone presiding. This is On Trial, brought to you by the Rattle Gym Broadcasting Network. Tonight, I am your defense attorney as such, Mr. Mark Radledge. And joining me, as he seems to do every Veterans Day for a subject matter such as this, from our Canadian office, ladies and gentlemen, making his yearly appearance on the network, it's Andrew Graham. How do you do, sir? Even Your Honor, this is uh, Street Legal uh, appearing for the Crown for the Prosecution. Outstanding. I understood none of that. Um <laughs> So, normally we are joined by Sean Comer. This is his and I monthly gig that we do. But Andrew Graham, uh, a while back, came to me and he said, there is a movie that I must bring charges upon. It, it vexes me. It taunts me. It hurts me, it does. And we must talk about this, and I must tell the people how it has wronged the state of cinema. And that movie that we're going to be putting on the docket tonight is 13 Hours, The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi, directed by Michael Bay, starring James Badge Dale, John Krasinski, and Max Martini. Now, Andrew, what gives, friend? Why are we talking about this movie tonight? Well, I'm, uh, you know, I, you know, I've come on here a few times, and I've kind of alluded to my interest in history and military history and stuff like that, and I kind of have, uh, you know, a pretty good interest and a, a pretty, you know, fair collection of both what I'd call like, um, you know, I, I call it combat nonfiction, so kind of like the the on the ground descriptions of of what happened during certain incidents, so stuff like stuff like you know, Black Hawk Down, Band of Brothers, Thirteen Hours, for example. Um, and I like all these accordant movies too. So stuff like, um, you know, stuff like Zero Dark Thirty, stuff like again Black Hawk Down, um, Lone Survivor, things like that. And, and and this one came across. And there's a couple of things in it in particular that have kind of raised my ire because I actually read the book. I think the book's great, um, but this movie drives me a little bit to drink. So I figured, and it has one moment that will drive me to absolute rage. So it's like. Let's bring this one on on trial because I think it's worthy of it. It's also in that line of also potentially being, is it okay? Is it terrible? Is it good? Which I think is kind of a really good candidate for this show. Okay. Uh, I'd actually never seen it before. I think this was one of those where it was in the theaters and a lot of like VA groups went to go see it and whatnot. And I think it got some degree of coverage on like Fox News and whatnot because of the you know because it was based on the book um uh written by uh Michael Mitchell Zuckoff uh who wrote it in 2014 and it's the same name uh 13 hours secret soldiers of Benghazi um I you know there there was a lot of politics that kind of came out of this situation a lot of stuff you know people were yelling Benghazi at uh Hillary Clinton and all of that so I was at least tangentially aware of what this was, but I never had actually sat down to see it, and so when you pitched it, I was like, okay, well, it'll give me an excuse to watch it and see what all the hubbub was about. Now, normally, Sean has some notes for us on the craft of the film, um, some of the, you know, behind-the-scenes stuff, how we got how we got from concept to uh, to screen. Do you... Whether it's uh, what happened in history, some background context, or uh, studio notes, what do you got for us? Um, well, actually, just the thing you actually having the exact same thought. I pulled up the uh, uh, pulled up the uh, the Wikipedia page just to run over some of that one. So, um, why don't we start with? Um, do you want to go with film, or do you want to go with the history first? I think people should need to really need to understand the history of what happened here. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, this tells the story of, uh, of an incident that happened in, in ben, uh, Benghazi and Libya after the fall of the Gaddafi regime. 
on September 11 and 12, 2012. Um, I am by no means an expert on this next part of it, but and the who, what, and specifically the why of what happened. But I think you know most most American listeners would be pretty familiar to you know some controversy around uh, the initial reporting of the incident that it had originally been reported as a um, as a um, protest in response to a, a movie. I believe it was called the the Passion of Muslims or something like that. It was a, it was a fairly awful terrible movie that was both in production and message uh but what it actually turned out to be was a uh probably a much more organized terrorist attack um it ended up killing uh four americans i believe um then of course it went into a whole level of discussion around you know how did this how was this initially communicated how did this incident happen what um you know what was the involvement of President Obama at the time and and Secretary Hillary Clinton, and of course came up a lot during the 2016 election. So that's kind of the history side. Um, in terms of development, so um, uh, let me see. So yeah, it looks like pretty immediately the the uh, right to the book, the rights to the book were purchased by uh, Three Arts Entertainment and Paramount Pictures. Um, Chuck Hogan was set to adapt the book. Uh, and Michael Bay was set to direct and produce the thriller. I'm just going to look up Chuck Hogan just to see what other stuff he has on there. Uh, let's go mainly. Actually, he was... Uh, so he's actually a writer himself. And actually, one of his books uh, was adapted to the Academy Award-nominated movie The Town. Oh, Wow. So, uh, yeah, the only filmography, the other one he did was co-creator on a television series called The Strain that I'm not familiar with. Uh, let's see, you know, uh, it was filmed in Malta and Morocco. Um, uh, it was released on June 30th, 2015. Um, let's see, you know, box office, gross, uh, do, 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 $69.4 million against worldwide against a production budget of $50 million, making it Michael Bay's lowest grossing dire uh, directorial, uh, directorial film to date. Not enough ro um, not enough robots uh, and close-up shots of their balls. <laughs> I am directly under the enemy's testicles. <laughs> um, basically, it went to uh, very mixed reviews. Um, Sean has a quote lined up and of course it's been quite a bit of uh, there has been quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of argument over the film both in terms of what the uh, you know obviously what happened provoked a lot of secondary discussion of, of what happened during that incident there's also been some topics I, I guess Paramount definitely pushed it towards like you said there were some some definitely targeted screenings and, and Fox News seemed to have liked it quite a bit and, and things like that and I should probably go on uh, just to throw this one out here and I think the the movie does this well and I think the book's pretty explicit about it the book is not about figuring out whatever the hell Hillary Clinton had or had not to do with this okay um, so I there's some stuff here in the wiki I, I just find interesting so you have the critical response, you have the Libyan response, and the Libyan response, which I, which I find interesting. Um, I, I can't imagine there were a lot of professional critics who were in love with this, just because they they tend to they tend to run uh, American liberal, you know, they tend to sort of run away from lauding uh, the service and the war effort and things like that. So. Not a lot of shocks there, but here's what it says. Mixed reviews. Um, they thought it was a rather tame effort from Michael Bay, and they're not wrong, based on his other movies. Uh, it had a 51% rating on Rotten Tomatoes with 282, 218 reviews. It's not bad. It's a pretty, pretty good size uh, pool of reviews there. Uh, the site reads it's a comparatively mature and restrained effort from Michael Bay albeit one that can't quite boast the impact of its face based story deserves um, Soren Anderson from the Seattle Times gave it 3 out of 4 saying it lacks its, 
distinctive characters but ultimately summarizes 13 hours as engrossing and a ground level depiction of heroism in the midst of the fog of war um Inku Kang of the Rap however uh praised it for its actions (laughs) yes praised it for its action scenes but pans direct Bay's direction as myopic and she said 13 hours is the rare Michael Bay movie that wasn't made with teenage boys in mind and she ain't wrong but that doesn't make his latest any less callously juvenile. And Lindsay Barr of the AP was critical of the film's direction and cinematography and found the screenplay really confusing. And she's not wrong either. More on that in a moment. <laughs> uh, similarly, The Economist, which is a magazine that I tend to enjoy reading, described the film as a sleek and poorly scripted and large, meaningless film. And the Libyan said, you know, we were there too, and we and not all of us were shooting at the Americans, thank you very much. We, we uh, helped contribute saving the U.S. ambassador. Uh, Libya's foreign ministry spokesman, Salah uh, ben- Belnaba, denounced the film's portrayal of the Libyan people and described it as fanatical and ignorant. Eh, you gotta know your audience. Libyan's culture and information minister, Omar... Gawari also criticized the film, saying the movie shows us the U.S. contractors who actually failed to secure the ambassador as heroes, adding that Michael Bay turned America's failure to protect its own citizens in a fragile state into a typical action movie all about the American heroism. To which I say, yeah, yeah, sure. It, it, it was, yes, that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> who the hell's going to watch this thing? God damn. All right. Um, there's a whole thing here on historical accuracy, which you can read on the Wikipedia page itself. But I think that's a large part of your prosecution. So we'll get there. Um, any other notes before I jump into the plot synopsis? Uh, you know what? I think that's probably it, except for the fact that I'm kind of surprised that Inku King doesn't actually show up on the uh, on the damn you Hollywood list of reviewers a lot more often. Uh, yeah, I... I, I just don't see her amongst the reviews or her stuff hasn't annoyed me to the point it's worth re- re- reading out loud. But I'll look for her now that, you, that you've that you sort of rolled your eyes at her because I want to see what else she's done. I've uh, listened to her on a couple of podcasts and she can be grating. Uh, well, yeah. all right. Well, well, we're doing Damn You Hollywood tomorrow night for Dr. Sleep. I'll look for her and see what she thought. Uh, see if she wrote a review that says, please invite me to parties. All right. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to largely read from this because there's a lot of detail here and I don't want to I don't want to slight the movie by doing one of my usual this thing happened this thing happened lobster we're done you know I, I think the details are important here so in 2012 Benghazi Libya is named one of the most dangerous places in the world and countries have pulled their diplomatic offices out of the country in fear of an attack by militants the US however still has a diplomatic compound open in the city. Less than a mile away is a CIA outpost called the Annex, which is protected by a team of private military contractors from Global Response Staff, otherwise known as GRS. New to the detail is Jack Silva, who is played by John Krasinski, who arrived in Benghazi and is picked up by Tyrone Roan Woods, commander of the GRS team and a personal friend of Silva. Arriving at the Annex, Silva is introduced to the rest of the GRS team and the CAA chief of station, who constantly gives the team strict reminders to never engage the citizens. Uh, Just take pictures, Rambo. Prior to the U.S. ambassador's arrival, the GRS team members visit the special mission, the location where the ambassador will be staying. They review the location, warn its diplomatic security agents about the risk of minimal security arrangements and the high probability of a surprise attack due to its volatile circumstances. The U.S. Ambassador Chris Stevens arrives in Benghazi to maintain diplomatic connections amidst the political and social chaos with limited protection from five diplomatic security agents, principally Scott Wicklund and Dave Ubin, along with the guards hired from the local February 17th Martyrs Brigade Militia, nicknamed 17 Feb. On the morning of the 11th anniversary of the September 11th attacks, Stevens notices suspicions, suspicious men taking pictures of the compound and notifies his security detail. Back at the annex, Silva finds out that his wife is pregnant. But, and to anyone that's married and, you know, and has to work a lot and, you know, and, or be away from his family, boy, was that the most truthful scene in this entire movie. The, the, the mom in the drive-thru, just give me all the burgers, I don't care anymore. That was perfect. Where did those other eight kids come from? 
it's, it's, after a while, you just lose count, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> you don't know the, the neighbor's kids, your kids. You just know you just know that you'd like a clean floor once in a while. That's what it boils down to. <clears throat> that night, a group of militants from Ansar al Sharia assault the compound. The 17 Feb guards quickly surrender their post, allowing the attackers easy access to the special mission compound. Wickland takes Stephen and Smith, an IT specialist, into the safe room. Unable to breach the safe room, the attackers set the building on fire, like you do, hoping to burn the men out. Wickland is able to escape, but loses both Stevens and Smith. At the annex, the GRS team desperately want to go to the compound to help, but the chief refuses, fearing that the team's departure would expose the annex. However, the team dispatches to the compound and meets up with the DS agents. Silva and Woods go into the building to try to save, to find Stevens and Smith, but are only able to find Smith's body. After an intense firefight inside the compound against the mili militants, the DS team retreats, but after Wickland goes into the wrong direction, they are followed by militants on their way back to the annex. Later, the GRS team also retreats to the annex. Knowing an attack by the militants is imminent, the CAA staff of the annex makes several desperate calls for help. The only help they can get is from Glenn Bubb Doherty, a GRS officer in Tripoli, who informs a team, including two Delta operators, that, the, that fly to Benghazi after several delays. Meanwhile, the GRS team fends off the militants as they try to breach the annex perimeter. After repelling the largest attack wave, the annex receives word from ISR that help is en route. The Tripoli GRS reinforcements arrive and begin preparing the CIA and DS staff to depart for the airport. The militants launch a mortar attack in which Ubin and Geis are wounded. Geis' left arm is partially severed. Woods rushes to aid Geis and is killed by another mortar round. Doherty is also killed when a third mortar detonates directly in front of him. With the GRS team compromised and the annex now vulnerable, the, G the remaining GRS operators watch as a convoy of vehicles rolls towards the annex. Fearing the worst, the operators prepare to make a final stand until it is revealed that the convoy is an element of the Libya Shield Force militia escorting the GRS reinforcements. They also find out that Stevens was found behind the compound, but was pronounced dead at the hospital. At the airport, the CIA staff and the wounded guys board the plane to Tripoli, while the remainder of the GRS team waits for the next plane with the bodies of Stephen Smith, Woods, and Doherty. Closing titles reveal that all the surviving members of the Annex security team received contractor medals in a private ceremony and have since retired from the GRS team and live with their families. Geis was able to save his arm after several surgeries. All right, and now the moment you've all been waiting for, your prosecution, sir. All right, may it please the court. Uh, my argument tonight will be that this movie is basically a cover album. A lot of what you've seen here has been done better elsewhere. Uh, if you want, allow me to reference my notes. Um, let's, you know, let's start with a bit, bit about characterization. And, you know, I'm going to give credit where credit's due. This movie is cast really, really well, and with a lot of actors I like. Like, I mean, this is kind of John Krasinski's first foray into not looking at the camera, as Stewie, as Stewie Griffin would say. And uh, he does well on it. James Dale Badge is really, really good in this, kind of shoring up some other sh strong work that he's done through his career. Specifically, I can think of, like, uh, HBO's The Pacific. Um, Max Martini, who you cite, is kind of a, a pretty uh, solid character actor. He's kind of good at this role of being, you know, cop, soldier, everything like that. All the guys kind of work competently. They look comp, you know, they look competent when they move. They all get along well. That said, I think probably one of the main crimes on this movie is how arch it is in terms of how all the characters are. Um, I'm going to take, uh, and this is me singling out the characters as they're shown and not as the actual people i have to probably parse that a little bit but i'm going to talk about uh, the way that uh, tonto is portrayed so he's kind of the guy if you're wondering who he is he's the guy telling all the jokes and that is literally the only thing he does the entire goddamn movie <laughs> now i went back to the book i checked it he was definitely maybe one of the more talkative ones and one of the ones who you know who did have a penchant for making more of the you know the jokes here and there but it's like come on every second this guy's making some kind of wisecrack like uh, you know it's kind of the i swear we were this close to going to a john wayne movie where one of them was going to start getting called moose <laughs> <laughs> you 
moving on to that, let's talk a little bit about some of the character interactions. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about the um, the uh, the interaction with Bob, who's the the CIA chief, um, played by uh, David uh, Costa by Costa Biel, Costa Biel. Not sure how to uh, how to pronounce that, but. Uh, He's well known for, uh, I know him best from uh, his role, I think it's Daniel Hardman on Suits, and hey Mark, mark this one off on your count on uh, the bingo card, he was also in The Wire. He sure was! <laughs> and he's a good actor, but again, you know, and I think this goes a lot to how it was written and how this movie movie was directed, his character is arc, arc or very, very arch again. Everything he says goes to within one role, and that's to actually going through and just saying, you know, no to everything, be a dick to everybody, and, and everything like that. And I've read the book. They don't, you know, they don't strain that, uh, you know, they don't beat around the bush, but there's definitely tension between the GRS guys and uh, the CIA chief, but, but it's just so arch all the time. I think probably one of the better things where this movie works better is later on when, when the annex is about to come under attack, and Bob's in there actually organizing his team and 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 you know getting it ready and showing that he's more than just you know you know the suit the guy that says you know that says I don't like your attitude put your badge and your gun on my desk by the end of the day that sort of thing when he's not in there I think that works quite well which kind of goes to my next point about this and this uh, brings us into a point that Michael Bay has quite obviously lost the phrase show don't tell because honest to God, nobody ever shuts up in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes to the, it goes to the state of pacing. Like, like I said, when I was reviewing this the other night, I had the book in front of me. I was flipping about stuff. And a lot of it is, a lot of it is, um, is accurate. There's also some stuff that's not accurate. For example, let's go right to the, uh, and maybe this also kind of ties into my arch argument, but going to the rather memorable, scene at the beginning of the movie right after uh, Roan picks up Jack at the airport um, and they get stopped at the um, stopped at the in the middle of the uh, the um, roadblock and they both draw down on the guys and it looks like he basically starts talking shit to the guy saying like you know do you want to die right now because I'm ready to die right now that never happened <laughs> <laughs> they were going they were they, no make no mistake about it Benghazi was a scary place and these guys were, you know, these guys were professionals. They knew what they were going into, and they they were aware of their surroundings and what kind of hazards were out there. That said, these guys were never going to be the ones to draw first. These guys were going through security checks all the time. They generally were able to talk their way out of it, and things like that. If we want to get into a whole idea of how you could have handled that scene differently, definitely still sell the tension, but don't turn it into again a fucking John Wayne movie. Is this me, cowboy? Is it you? <laughs> Or anyone who wants a little uh, Full Metal Jacket reference there. So, anyway, moving on to some of the kind of the pacing and and tension and and kind of talking issues. I think that again goes, you know, a little bit to a scene later when they're escorting a couple of CIA people and they pick up a tail and then, you know, get into the Fast and the Furious car chase. Which, again, there were definitely times they had to get out of there, but they didn't do the good old let's run them into a into a front end loader sort of gig either. <laughs> And again, it, it's kind of taking away from the whole idea of the ten, the idea of tension and slow burn, where I think when you watch one of these movies and you're building towards something, that's the way it works. Uh, you know, a couple of good examples I can think of this was like Ridley Scott's Black Hawk Down, or I, you know, another good one where the tension's building is you know Catherine Bigelow Zero Dark Thirty. Both of those movies really know how to, you know, take things into how to scale it back, how to how to stretch out the tension without necessarily, you know, going zero to 60 as, as Michael Bay, you know, cannot, uh, cannot resist. He just has to be at 11 all the time. I'll even extend that to the scene that you mentioned about um, the conversation with, uh, between Jack and his wife when he finds out she's pregnant. That definitely happened when they were there. It definitely didn't happen the day before the whole attack went down and everything like that. So... It's uh, it's again one where they're just like making it as loud as humanly possible to try and just kind of 
look like it's ramping up tension, but at some point it just turns into noise. Um, on a side note on this, as everyone's kind of interested on the whole craft of Michael Bay, uh, Lindsay Ellis has got a great video. I believe it's called Why You Never Remember Anything That Happens in a Michael Bay Movie. <laughs> and this is part of the problem of it, because there is so much noise and so much cacophony that you forget the actual rhythm of the movie. Um, and I think that kind of applies to, to, uh, towards the end of the movie as well. And, and uh, I'll skip out my one scene that I'll say for the end. But, um, you know, right after Roan and, uh, and, and uh, sorry, I can't remember his name, uh, Bob are killed. And, uh, you know, they moved around where some people were to get Jack's, Jack's reaction to things. And again, credit to Krasinski for portraying this well. Um, but I think on some level, and and you know, from what I've heard about some guys, and, and heard about some guys who have been through combat, and I'm a big fan of the the Cleared Hot podcast, which is a podcast by Andy Strump, who's a former Navy SEAL. So he's talked quite a bit about some of his experiences. Some of these guys won't emotionally react until after they're out of it, and. You know, there's a scene where he finds it initially that that Roan gets killed, and then Jack sees his his body being pushed over the side, which he was actually standing on another rooftop in reality, but they they put him on the ground there for for greater effect. But on some level, you could have dialed that back. You could have had you could have definitely had him flinch. You could have had it him show it in his face what he was feeling, and and not necessarily have to basically run up and start threatening guys and then you know later at the airport when he calls his wife and this is one where where it was confirmed where it's like that's where he he emotionally got emotional about the conversation have it happen there you know let it build let it simmer let it get to that point um so i mean that's kind of a bit about pacing and and everything like that I'm going to move a little bit on to action as well. And I mean, as much as, as you know, Michael Bay is, you know, kind of an action auteur, I would kind of argue that he's more of an explosion auteur. Um, <laughs> any shaky t- cam aside, and literally I wrote down in one of my comments was buy a fucking steady cam. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think this actually came up during a scene where I kid you not, it was actually in a boardroom. It's like he could not have a boardroom scene without the, the shaky cam going on. Um, but again, there's uh, the action can be hard to follow, and it's ironic because on some level, the story of what happened here, especially, and oddly enough, it actually applies more to the last gunfight than, than anything that happens before, is that it gets really muddled, even though the area was kind of the, we'll call it the battle space, for lack of a better word, was four buildings that they were posted on top of and then shooting in whatever direction the bad guys were coming. So it, it's kind of a, a pretty easy area to kind of lay out. And even then, I think it was an effort for Michael Bay to try and, uh, you know, try and ramp up the tension. He couldn't keep his geography straight. He couldn't keep his angle straight. So um, one of the kind of rules of thumb, and, and you're going to look for this when every time you watch one of these gunfights now, generally what you know, an, uh, an actor or a director who's trying to keep all of this straight will always have your one side of guys shooting in one direction and your other side of guys shooting in the other direction, unless, of course, they're switching the camera around with a common point of reference in there to kind of, you know, act as, as reference for the audience itself. So with that one, Michael Bay kind of throws it out because generally they'll shoot the good guys firing right to left, the bad guys firing left to right, but then the bad guys will be firing right to left and left to right, and it gets all over the place. And I mean, this is this is something that's called the way they probably did this was what they call shooting for coverage, which is where really what they do is just get a bunch of guys shooting in different directions and then re-edit it later, which I think is probably the uh, the uh, the major culprit of uh, a lot of Michael Bay's work. Um, if you want to look at a couple of better examples, like I went back and did some research on this one and just watched a couple of scenes, but like again, you know, going to some stuff that's kind of started this, but something like Black Hawk Down where Ridley Scott does a really good job of being able to kind of keep the geography straight. And at one point, even during the scene that's fairly early in the movie, he actually manages to to kind of obey the rule and break the rule by actually having the battle space flip because something 
happens, and then all the guys have to start shooting in the other direction, but you can still follow the action. Another one was was uh, Peter Berg, who I'm kind of surprised more of his movies has, haven't ended up on this show because he is uh, both a very confident and very frustrating director at the same time. A uh, <laughs> couple of his gunfights in Lone Survivor are really, really good, especially given that in that case they all happen in a forest, so you don't have nearly as many kind of obvious man-made geographic points of reference for everyone. So, with the action out of the way, and the pace out of the way, and all of that out of the way, we bring this to the scene that made me drop my jaw. <laughs> the scene that made me rend what little hair I have on my head, and say, are you kidding me? So this, um, this happens late in the movie. Uh, there is a scene where um, basically right before there's a there's a break between firefights. Everyone's kind of we're doing a quick check in with all the moments, and at that point, um, Tyrone S. Wood, so Roan, um, has a scene where he's in a in a bathroom or something like that. He grabs a picture of him and his infant son and puts it in his plate carrier vest. So that occurs, and he goes back out there. And then, of course, as, as noted, he ends up um, actually getting killed during the uh, by a mortar during the final fight. So anyway, point one, Michael Bay pulls out one of his favorite favorite gags, which is the uh, let's follow the bomb all the way down, which he did from uh, which he did from uh, Pearl Harbor and decided to bring back here. By the way, mortars do not work like that. They are <laughs> not 50 gallon fuel drums. Also, these guys were firing machine guns with tracers. They were not firing plasma rifles. <laughs> so, anyway, sorry. I had to go off on that one because it's just like, you know, a lot of... And I acknowledge, many of these are constant criticisms of Michael Bay, but moving on. So, this one is particularly egregious to me. So, anyway, the mortar comes down, the explosion happens, and I think you're assuming for the worst. And then said photo photo of his man and his infant son who in real life in real life he never got to see again comes floating down through the top of the screen like the goddamn feather at the start of Forrest Gump <laughs> I am not kidding like this made me actually angry this does I'm 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 somebody who chose not to serve and and that's the choice I made with why I have a tremendous amount of respect for those who did and, and you know this got moved to today and and uh, I, I don't want to you know run kind of draft off it but you know Veterans Day in the US Remembrance Day or uh, here in Canada and, and along there but it's like you know if you want to make I get that these movies can be somewhat emotionally manipulative and in a lot of ways awesome it is but it's like when you're dealing with an actual person who had actual loss like have a little have a little bit of dignity for him and it's just like this was just a cheap cheap move and it just made infuriated me with that the prosecution rests okay so I don't know how many people have studied the long sorted history of Scotland. But a lot of people saw Braveheart and enjoyed it. Whether or not it was historically accurate, or not, I certainly did. It's one of my favorite movies. There have been plenty of war pictures. Glory, for example. Uh, they may have been pretty accurate. They may not have. There may have been a lot of conjecture, a lot of inference. Um, one can never tell totally. Remember, movies are a narrative piece of art. The object is to tell a story. These are not documentaries. So I think a degree of forgiveness must be factored into any one of these based on real life situation type movies. Especially ones dealing with battles, uh, firefights, etc. I think if you were to just put a camera up 
on the average firefight. I mean, we talked about this a year ago when we looked at the Netflix slash BBC series. Uh, you know, some battles take days, hours. It's hard to encapsulate all of that in a two-hour motion picture. So cuts have to be made. Narrative choices have to be made. Sometimes you have to sacrifice a lot of accuracy for character building, world building as such. And you say world building, well, you know, real life. Well, look, how many of you are familiar with uh, Libya? Before or after failed state? I would imagine not a lot of people listening to this podcast. So these things are things that need to be set up. So when I and while I respect the prosecution's argument about uh, the way the film was handled versus the uh, what really happened, one even the guy who wrote the book, you're still getting a person's perspective. Um, I think that creative licensing is okay. And it's not something I'm going to hold against this or any other film. Unless, like, you know, they threw in something really absurd, like Martians or something. You know, right in the, right in the middle of Libya. Yeah, I mean, for that, and this isn't the only one. Uh, I'll certainly give the uh, the defense that point. If you really want to talk about one that did that, Lone Survivor's bookends are completely fictional. Right. So, I I, I think that when you're sitting down and you're sort of crafting a narrative that is representational of a factual event, historical event, uh, you, there, there's going to be a lot of playing with the truth there. What really matters is the craft of the movie and the narrative, the storytelling, the performances, etc. And my defense for the movie is such. Well, I can certainly appreciate sort of the Mr. Wizard, things don't work that way aspect of it. What I'm here for is tell me a story that I'm interested in with characters I can identify with. So let's take our lead, John Krasinski, who plays uh, Jake Sil Jack Silva. And I think, you know, look, Michael Bay is not known for the best characterization. Uh, I think see the Transformers movies, everyone is sort of playing at you know, high comedy levels. Not really relatable characters here. They're more comic booky, y um, and not the good comic books. But I think here, Jack Silva, even as a, said, uh, former U.S. Navy SEAL and all of that, you know, and clearly, you know, one of the many badasses around the world, is still somebody I think the average audience member can identify with. And he is your, your sympathetic character that takes you along through the narrative in what is really a strange and interesting world. You know, this world of uh, contract civilian security forces uh, defending CIA spies, analysts, etc. in a failed state somewhere in North Africa slash the Middle East. These are, you know, for the most, for most of us, this is all pretty foreign and fantastic stuff here. And so you need somebody, you need your Luke Skywalker character to go along with to get you, you know, through all these crazy places. And I think John Krasinski does a really good job, and he's written really well uh, as Jack Silva, as somebody who the average person, as I said before, can identify with. You know, he's got this family. He's, there's a situation which I think is we can all sympathize with where... Um, Sometimes things don't work out the way you want them to, and you have to make hard choices, and sometimes those hard choices take you away from your family, and, you know, that leaves one parent there to single parent uh, in a situation that they were not counting on, uh, but they try to make do the best they can because we all have mortgages to pay and bills to pay and whatnot. So I think these are all good bits of character and inner conflict and drama that the audience can buy into. And there was a comment made about Pablo Schreiber's character, uh, good old porn stash, Chris Tonto Peranto, <sighs> U.S. Army, former U.S. Army Ranger. And I, I look, they can't all be super serial, jarhead, no personality type characters. Even if they were all actually like that. You have to have somebody doing a thing. 
to keep people interested. Because if this is going to be two hours of just bullets flying, you're going to lose people. You've got to have characters, and those characters have to be different. So there has to be at least one clown in there doing clown stuff. So him dancing with, you know, flashlights going, I'm sexy and I know it. Isn't that funny that that's one of the few things about this movie that I saw only hours ago that I remember about this movie? That's fair, and oddly enough, he he actually did that. <laughs> oh, did he? That's a, that, that was a real thing, huh? No, no, that was a real thing, and I mean, to, to talk a little bit about that, like, there is a... And actually, a lot of the jokes that are told in this movie were actually told at some point. They just basically all got shuffled over to, over to Tonto. There's a, there's a lot of, from what I understand of it, you know, kind of organizations like these, particularly among the, you know, kind of the higher end, you know, special forces, there is an awful lot of shit talking and an awful lot of ball busting. Oh, yeah. Look, I, I as people who know, listen to the podcast, I, and I, I never say which one or what company, but I happen to work in a uh, correctional institution, and I work with nurses, and I work with deputies, and there's a lot of dark humor. <laughs> they're, they're ha- or we go crazy. You, ha- you know, we make jokes. We, we rag on each other. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've said to one of the deputies, just shut the fuck up and open the door already. You know... <laughs> At your fucking face. Um, not professional, not the least bit. But this is, but we, you know, we talk this way and we act this way to, to get through the day. It's how we make the best of what can be a very intense and frustrating and depressing situation. So, like, I think that's, I think that's all real. And again, you always have to look at this from the viewing audience's perspective. You need fun and interesting stuff to look at that's different. It can't all be the same. I can't tell you how many, you know, if you look at some of the other uh, movies uh, that we hold dear that deal with war, like Platoon or Full Metal Jacket, there are very distinctive characters. And then, you know, they're, they're all wearing, obviously, army fatigues, you know, same uniforms, whatever. But it's their personalities that shine out and differentiate them and make them different. Uh, otherwise, you get lost to who's who, and then it just becomes a mass of people talking and shouting and shooting, which you don't want, and that takes away from the craft. Uh, the prosecution brought up some of the unreadable action scenes in this. Um, the defense has no counter argument. <laughs> I normally won't cop to, you know, no, normally when we do these, I, uh, I, I either the strictly prosecute or I strictly defend or I make up some cockamamie answer to something. But ultimately, I, I, I'm to get through this, I, I have to say, yeah, some of those when, when, when your major draw in this thing is to show battle and some of the battle is utterly unreadable. It's like, well, <laughs> Michael Bay maybe should stop doing action. Maybe do a drama. I don't know. But this this was not the easiest thing in the world to follow. Yeah, and I mean, I was gonna actually, I never didn't get a chance to. I was actually going to go back and check some of his older movies, and I think he's actually degraded since then. <laughs> like, I mean, if you go if you go back to The Rock, for example, like I think if I remember right, there were some pretty good gunfights in that movie. But it's like it's just gotten so shaky cam, so quick cut that it it's all over the place. Uh, lastly. I think Michael Bay does his level best with... Uh, actually, I want to bring up one other character, and then uh, and then I'll talk about uh, settings and whatnot. But the, a lot was said about the character of uh, Bob, the chief, played by David Costable. And, again... Most human beings are not this one note, but you have a choice in movies like this. You can either it's either the Libyans are the bad guys and the U and the and the U the Americans are the good guys, but then you lose you lose part of the story. Uh, it becomes even more fictional than you know what you what you've got. Um, so then you have to figure out well who else is a villain in this story. Because stories need antagonists. Other than uh, that, other, if you don't have an antagonist, what you have is a documentary. You just have two hours of film. Um, 
they there needed to be somebody for the audience to root against, to boo and hiss. Somebody this needed to be, especially because this, this is seen as like a monumental uh, error in judgment, and a you know and a big problem for the U.S. Obviously. So somebody needs to be left holding the bag. And in a lot of these movies, there's always like a general or somebody. This is kind of a stock character thing. There's always somebody who, you know, is just make, always making the wrong call, but is assuredly making the wrong call because he thinks it's the best call, not because he's malevolent. And they're, they're, this movie did need that character. You needed somebody to uh, root against. Because clearly the GRS guys are the ones you're supposed to be rooting for. And you don't want to totally make the Libyans the bad guys, as I said before, because, well, that's racist. D-A-T-S. That's racist. So, who's left? Well, make it the, make it the station chief, and it works out fine. I think Michael Bay did his level best with the setting. I mean, when you're talking about the desert... You're talking about North Africa. Not a lot of environmental things to really work with there. And then again, a lot of you know, a lot of this you're you're dealing with them, you know, shooting in the dark. I mean, there's only so much you can do with that. So I think, well, I'm not going to fight about the, uh, you know, the the use of the shaky cam and all of that. But I think when they when they're when they're not fighting. And you know, and there's drama to be had, such as it was. I think Bay did a pretty good shot, job of setting up shots and presenting interesting locations and scenarios and uh, settings and whatnot. To where I, at least in those moments, I was kept interested in what was happening. And I will let the uh, prosecution have one final word, and then I think we'll wrap up for the night. Do you have anything else, Mr. Graham? I'd actually like to uh, address one of the defense's points since uh, since you brought it up, and I, I couldn't find a, a good spot for it. But kind of talking about the whole idea of of heroes and villains and and uh, and going around that topic, and and I think Michael Bay in this case either wasn't willing to go one way or the other with it. Or, or just didn't have the chops to look at, do it that way. Because I think you're right. I think that's the way they kind of decided to take Bob was to make him, just make him kind of the out and out kind of, you know, wimpy bureaucrat that that you know doesn't know what's actually going on here and, and is maybe a bigger threat during this whole situation, as opposed to kind of trying to also tell a story of of you know. Some Libyans are bad, some Libyans are good, some are are definitely in between, and I think he just couldn't... I don't know if it was an unwillingness or an inability or, or what look, happened there. Look, One man, ain't, that, ain't nobody got time for nuance. Yeah, exactly. But, I mean, even at the end of the movie, like, right after, at the end of... Um, right after the firefight, after they've all left the compound, like, there's, like, this extended shot... Uh, through one of the areas where the firefight happened, all the families are coming out to mourn for the guys who who the GRS guy is shot, and it's like, wait a second, these were definitely the bad guys here. <laughs> this wasn't this wasn't the tragic people who were caught in the middle. These, these were definitely the guys who were trying to kill our heroes and were suddenly going for this this sympathy th- shot. And I'm not I'm not by any way, you know, devaluing human life in that moment or anything like that. But from a narrative point of view, it kind of it kind of is this weird swerve where again it sounds to me it kind of felt like Michael Bay was trying to to you know have a cake, have his cake and eat it too okay uh let me um we'll kind of switch gears here with our final wrap up comments i will i will tell you this so i figured this was going to be 90 minutes 2 hours flat uh and i figured i'd bang it out this morning while uh we were waiting to get my my uh I caught a flat, and so I was waiting for the guy to come out and change the tire, um, you know, get me a new tire and all of that. So figure, get up early in the morning, go do that, and then take my kids to go see the new John Cena movie, Playing with Fire. That was that was how my day was going to go. And two hours into this movie, it's still going. This thing is 144 yeah. minutes long. Does Michael Bay not know how to edit? 
Jesus Christ. I'm all for world building and setting up characters and kind of painting, you know, getting everybody in place, putting up all your dominoes so that you can knock them down. But oh my God, it took forever to get into, to get to where the meat of the movie is. And then it goes on. And uh, like the movie's called 13 Hours. I'm pretty sure that's how long the movie was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know what? Like, I mean, again, you look at, there's a, you know, I could name off the top of my head like five directors who could have done this movie better. Probably could have made it shorter. And again, given it a little bit more substance at the same time. But literally because literally there has to be exposition for everything. It takes forever to get any place. Yeah. I, the, a lot of the first hour of this movie could have been cut. You just need a little bit of Pablo Schreiber dicking around to get his character. Oh, um, yeah. One or two scenes of the other characters kind of, you know, crying into their beer. You know, a scene of Krasinski calling him to his wife like, eh, things are not so good. <laughs> you know, okay, we got it. We now have reasons to care about these people. We know them as people. Now start shooting at them. Yeah. I mean, there's details here that could have also made it more interesting as well. Like, for example, one of the things that was going to happen was that apparently Bob actually offered to to actually move all of the people from the diplomatic side into the annex for their visit just because it was be better secured, and the diplomatic side actually declined. And there's actually a guy they totally omitted from this movie <laughs> who was actually the... So Roan wasn't actually the commander of the GRS team. Uh, the team leader was actually another CIA guy. Oh really? Okay. Who just does not show up at all. Yeah, I'm sure characters. And I get got... that for for reducing the number of characters sure. to try and keep it a little tighter, but I was starting to lose track of people after a while. Like if yeah. you weren't John Krasinski or uh, James Badge Dale or uh, Pablo Schreiber or the guy with the beard next to Pablo Schreiber for the last yep. part of the film, like I don't know who any of these people are anymore. I'm losing track of who's what. Yep. You're, you're you're getting mixed up in the beard count. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, it's not the worst movie I've watched. We have, Sean and I have definitely had some real turkeys this year. And that's kind of the point of the show is we we look at some of these movies that everyone just sort of condemns and we look at movies that everyone lauds and says, "Eh, you know, um we we like to we like to kill our babies and we like to find the jewels in the um in the muck and mire." A film out there so you know where this one sits for me eh, it's probably in the middle you know where it's like it's not the worst thing I've ever seen it's not the best thing I've ever seen it's just kind of there I didn't uh, I had an enjoyable enough time watching it but I wish it had been about I don't know a half an hour to 45 minutes shorter I'm, I mean with the exception of the one thing that literally blew my mind when it's like who the hell let this through I kind of had the same reaction in the movie where it's like, yeah, it's there. Yeah. Like, well, that was the thing that happened. Oh, gosh, what did I... I saw a movie... Uh, I want to say it was maybe last year. Um, and it was uh, another one of these, you know, true stories. I want to say it was... Uh, which it was... It took... It takes place in Afghanistan, like, right after September oh, 11th. Oh, was it 12 Strong? Yeah. I have not seen that yet. I, it was. Uh, I think I had just gotten like my AMC Stubbs card or whatever. So at that point, I was just starting to see anything that was in theaters, um, you, know, well, you know, so I could use it. And I think that was a week where it was like, well, it was that or some other thing that I really didn't want to see. So I saw it, and it was fine. Like that's that's the thing with a lot of these pictures. There's some of them that get me emotionally, and I'm like I, you know, I can kind of see the tragedy and the story they're telling. Those almost work better for me. Like I don't. Look, I'm sure to the people who were involved in this, this whole tale is very tragic. And I'm not trying to minimize that. I'm saying there are some movies that handle the tragedy of a, of a situation a lot better than this one does. And those movies have more of a profound effect on me than this one did. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm about the same place on this one where it's like, this could have been handled better. Again, you know, a better filmmaker, maybe a little bit better scripting and, it, and this could have been a pretty damn good movie all right andrew uh we sometime between now and veterans day we need to figure out what we're doing for veterans day i think this is a yearly thing i think i'm gonna drag you onto the network <laughs> every veterans day to handle some some such and thing that we do so, some war picture 
Works for me. Maybe uh, you know I've heard I've heard Pearl Harbor is horrible. Maybe you and I should debate the merits of that one. I haven't actually seen please, it. Please, please, Mark, don't make me watch that. <laughs> <laughs> For the love of God. <laughs> I go I go right oh, for the low hanging fruit. Oh god no. Titanic that was then bombed by the Japanese was not worth it. And and actually I only know this because I've actually had to sit through another podcast this year debating the merits of Pearl Harbor. <laughs> um I've never seen Hamburger Hill. I don't know how good or bad it is. I know like it came out like in a there was like a slew of nom movies. Uh, that all kind of came, yeah. came out around the same time, and that was just one that I missed. I think I, I vaguely remember watching Hamburger Hill when it was on the Canadian History Channel before it went the same way as the American History Channel and turned into stuff about lumberjacks and aliens building pyramids. <laughs> Terrific. Well, we have a year to figure it out. I'm sure between the two of us we'll see something that has to do with soldiers and war and fighting and fussing. And uh, whether it's TV party and on trial or uh, what have you, we'll figure out what we want to do and we'll talk about it then. How does that sound? That sounds good to me. All right. And theoretically, maybe kind of, sort of, maybe, the next time you'll see our friend here from the Canadian office will be for the other thing we like to talk about, which is uh, good old uh, British Crown, The Crown, season three, which is... Maybe kind of sort of pencil in for December 10th, depending on how life goes for for the both of us. So if not then, then sometime close to that. But we will be talking The Crown uh, shortly after it drops on Netflix, which is going to be the uh, the 17th of November. It's actually this Sunday coming up, depending on when you listen to this. So, yeah, I'm so, really looking forward to that. Yeah, all new cast playing the same uh, playing the same characters. They're, they're t- the two year rotation is in effect. So we got seasons three and four with these folks. We'll see how it all plays out. But yeah. I'm excited. I enjoy the crown. I'm gonna give I'm gonna give credit where credit's due. After watching the first uh, watching the first like five seconds of the new trailer, I believe it's was it Olivia Coleman, I wanna say. Olivia Coleman who's taking over from Claire Foy as uh, as Queen Elizabeth. I could not get over how similar her voice was to the way that kind of Claire Foy had portrayed it in, in the previous series. I'm gonna miss Chlorophoy. She was uh, she was. Arr, arr. <laughs> um. All right. So with that said, are you doing any writing or other podcasting, or is there anything you want to promote real quick? Um. Sure. I'll promote a couple of quick things since I'm out there. Um. I'm going to do a quick shout out. Just uh, credit where credits due for some of my arguments tonight. Um. There's a great YouTuber called Rossitron. And he does kind of mini, about maybe 10, 15 minute video essays on specifically geared toward action movies, talking about the way they're shot, the way they're handled, things like that. He's He does some fantastic stuff. And again, it's it's pretty short. And he does a whole gamut of stuff. So, I mean, he's got stuff on Die Hard, Terminator, Predator. He handles a lot of the modern stuff. And, and, and he's quite good. Um, I, myself, I'm training at, uh, as, as I always tend to be training, I'm training at uh, Havoc JKD. Uh, and esteemed martial arts uh, here in Calgary. And uh, if you're not in Calgary, then I suggest you check out the uh, JKD Athletic Association for uh, for uh, any training locations near to you. I'd also thoroughly uh, encourage you to check out my instructor's new podcast, Jay Cooper. Uh, he's got a podcast called The Baying of the Hound that uh, for uh, anyone definitely on the martial arts end of things is well worth checking out. So with that said, thank you very much, Mark. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed this. Well, good. I'm glad you did. I always enjoy having you on. I'm just going to go ahead and pencil. I'm literally putting for next Veterans Day, which is actually a Wednesday, November 11th, I'm just putting something with Andrew Graham. Fair enough. (laughs) Also, there's one other thing that I think we might need to schedule in for if you want to do this again. Did we want to do a 2020 election night podcast? Yes. Okay. Well, I guess you'll be seeing a lot of me in November. (laughs) Yeah, that'll be the week before, as a matter of fact. Um, yes, me, me, you, and Robert can can once again tell everybody. Yeah, Trump's getting reelected. Get the fuck over it already. <laughs> um, whether you whether you love her or hate the guy, and I'm sure half the people listening to this hate the guy. All right, uh, tomorrow uh, we've got Doctor Sleep. We've got a review of AEW Full Gear that was recorded shortly before this one. It was myself and Chris Bailey. 
so go ahead and get our unvarnished opinions on that one. We talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and we we held no quarter and we gave none. So there, there you know there was a lot there was a lot of praise. There was a lot of things that needed to be changed. So give that a listen. Give Stephen King's end on source material. Give that a listen. We got Rum Ahoy, Time to Party coming up. The we got an on tri- another, another on trial. Sean will be back for this one for The Shining. Uh, I'm going to try out some new folks on some boxing coverage this weekend. We got Lee McGregor versus uh, Ukashir Farouk on ESPN Plus. Next week we got the boys' name of the game on source material: Ford versus Ferrari, Dragon Force, Extreme Power Metal, Shira season four, and the boys season one. So go ahead and give those a listen when they drop. Appreciate Andrew Graham for joining me tonight. This has been On Trial. Court is now out of session. Be well, be safe, and behave.